Now, Robin, I hope you don't get offended like Joe Theismann did at an event I emceed last weekend when I couldn't decide who to go first with in the interview session. I said I'd go with age before beauty, so we'll start with you. <laughs> but with Joe, it doesn't matter. He's going to talk anyway, so it really doesn't. <laughs> I got to tell you, Joe was talking, and Dave Casper was not supposed to be at this event, and he walked in and said, all right, Joe, shut up. You've talked enough. <laughs> and then he went up and sat next to him, so I'm going to make sure he doesn't talk anymore. But, I mean, Joe, just such a great Notre Dame man as you guys are. But, Robin, I keep learning about the catch. The first thing most of us learned in the last year was that was the first pass Tommy Clements ever threw to you in a game or in practice. That's absolutely correct. I, they had me... <laughs> Uh, in basically as a blocker, a second tight end. In fact, my uh, baptism of fire was during the Southern Cal game. Uh, Era just threw me to the wolves in the second half. And so I played the entire second half of the Southern Cal game strictly as a blocker. And uh, so we get down. That's how I got into the mix. The uh, last three or four games I played quite a bit. As we ran a two tight end offense. And so as we get down to the national championship, I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. Reggie Brooks, you're going to love this. Every year, at some point, I make fun of Reggie and his contact lenses. Reggie never wore his contacts in practice, and you'll remember he caught the two-point conversion that won the snowball. Lou Holtz was stunned that he caught the ball, because in practice he always dropped it because he never wore his contacts, but he wore them in the game. Well, Reggie, that is no longer the only Notre Dame contact lens story. Robin has one that might even surpass it. I just confided in Jack uh, a few minutes ago. <laughs> uh, confided? I, I got your permission. <laughs> okay. uh, and he told me your story. Well, uh, the morning uh, of the game, uh, back in those days, we had these big contact lenses that uh, fit around the, your whole eyeball so they wouldn't pop out. And they would tear your, eye, tear your eyes up. So. Uh, I'd left my contact lens case at the practice facility the night before, so I'd wrapped them up in wet paper towels and put them on my uh, uh, counter there at the hotel room. Well, I came back from breakfast the morning of the game, and they were gone. And that's, I didn't have a backup set. That was it. So I said, where are they? And I went and talked to the man. She goes, well, I just threw those away down the chute to, uh, to, the, to the basement. I went, oh, my goodness. I said, well, you know, I'm a blocker. I don't need to get those things, uh, you know. The, <laughs> Then I, then I said, you know, Dave's been, Dave was, had a, was fighting a virus at that time. So I said, you know, I might get in the mix here. Uh, he might get hurt. I better go look for him. So I go down to the basement, a big dumpster, and there was nothing in the dumpster except a little bit of trash and the two little wet paper towels with my lenses in them. <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> uh, and, that, and that's the absolute truth. And I, would, and I would be the governor of Alabama right now going into my 40th year. <laughs> So Notre Dame's ninth national championship almost ended up in the trash bin. It truly did. That's true. We just got to see your dramatic punt returns against Michigan State in 87. But I think it's appropriate that we're in the Renaissance Hotel right now because I think Tim triggered the renaissance of Notre Dame football at that time in a game the previous year at USC, last game of the year, 254 all-purpose yards, plus a little 56-yard punt return to put you in position to kick the winning field goal. Yeah, you know, that was a uh, play that we didn't expect to happen. The whole game, they had kicked the ball away from me, so Lou had called us over and said, hey, they're not going to kick the ball to Timmy, but so what, what we're going to do is we're going to send half the line to block, and the rest of you guys just come back just in case they shank it or something, and to our surprise, they kicked it right down the middle of the field. I mean, if you see me, I'm doing this it, like, it's coming, it's coming. It's, I, can, I can believe it was coming right at me. And uh, at that point, you know, when I looked at what I had in front of me, the guys had done a great job. It was just a matter of running the ball. 86 season was a tough season. The yeah. team played so well. You lost so many close games. As you look back on it, how important was winning that USC game? What kind of carryover did it have? Oh, it was, it was huge, you know. Uh, we had lost so many games, and in, in, that, in, in that game, we were, we were struggling pretty bad. I mean, we were down... A couple of touchdowns, I think, early in the fourth quarter. So if we'd have lost the game by two or three scores, I think we go into the offseason a little down. But uh, the fact of the matter is we kept fighting. And, and, you know, Lou, man, come on. You know, I mean, he's not going to allow anybody to quit anyway. But uh, we had good players. It was just a matter of adjusting to the new system that we had in place. And uh, it all came together for us in that game. And, and certainly that game uh, led us to a pretty good season in, in my senior year. 
You know, it's funny how times have changed, but one of the common denominators when you talk about Lou Holtz and Eric Parsegian is the players all say they were scared to death of him. Yeah. How yeah. could you be scared to death of little Lou? Well, look, and I, I believe it was Chuck Lanza. The first meeting that we had with Lou, he walked into the meeting room and Chuck had his feet up on, on the thing. And he just kicked his feet off the... And we were like, because Chuck, you know, back then he had a lot of hair. And, <laughs> you know, he, I mean, he was a big, burly guy. It was like, oh, my God, Chuck is going to kill this guy. You know what I mean? That's what we thought. But uh, and so he sort of took, a, took control of the room right away. And um, so, I mean, there were guys that had played with me that never played again after Lou got there. So, uh, I mean, literally, there'd be guys sitting on the, on the sidelines crying by the end of practice because he was really tough. But all he was trying to do was see, wh what were you there for? Were you there for yourself? Or were you there for Notre Dame? What was really going on? And uh, if you can handle it, then you were out and you didn't play. So, Chuck, every player I talk to tells that story. So I guess we got to give you a lot of credit for the turnaround as well. <laughs> Thanks for putting your feet up. <laughs> Robin, you were at uh, the luncheon a few weeks ago, and I asked the same question. You got to see Eric came and spoke with you. He just turned 90. He's still sharp as a tack. And I asked you guys what it would be like that night when Eric walked into the monogram room to speak to his team again. And Dave Casper said, we're still scared to death of him. You know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, when we'd be walking out to practice in, in a drizzly day, the players would be walking out and air would be in front of us, and you'd have start to hear this chant, air has stopped the rain. <laughs> air, and it would catch on, air has stopped the rain. And sure enough, it would stop. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it was quite unique. Uh, he, the gentleman worked very, very hard. He gained our respect, and uh, he expected excellence. And uh, because of his work, just like Coach Kelly, like Coach Holtz, uh, you wanted to return that uh, respect and uh, do not so much afraid of them, but you wanted to be as good as, as they wanted you to be. So that was kind of the gig, the gig on there. And they both had a fire. I had a chance to sit down with her right before his 90th birthday party, and he didn't remember that much about all the wins. But, boy, you talk about games that you lost. He remembered every play. He remembered the officials threw a flag, and then this happened, and then that happened. And he literally started turning red, started sweating. And, and I said, you're still upset about that game 40 years later. He said, you're damn right I am. I, I, and that's, what, that's exactly the way he was. I, I sat down with him at a golf tournament about four years ago. And we didn't talk about what that national championship year. We talked, I asked him about the uh, mirror defense that he put up against Texas, how that came about. Just sharp as it all get out. I mean to tell you, he, he ex sat down and explained all that, how they came up with it, et cetera, et cetera. So very unique. When you turn on ESPN and see a Dr. Lou segment, what goes through your mind? Lord have mercy for the nation. <laughs> <laughs> he went through quite a, quite, a bit, quite a bit of those. You know, I think the most unique thing that Lou did, um, and this really freaked us out because we, I mean, we didn't know the guy for the most part, but the night before game, we're in our suits, you know, whatever we're wearing, and he tells us to spread out so we could be in this room. So we all spread out on the floor, and he does this relaxation thing where he says, you know, your hands, you can't move your arms, and, and everybody stretch out like this. And it's like, I really can't move my arms. What's happening here? What's going on? If there was a $100 bill in front of you, you will not be able to pick it up. It was like, oh, I'll pick that $100 bill up. But. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, but he did little things like that, but that was something that I carried not only through Notre Dame, but through my 17 years in the NFL, every day, I mean, every game, I would get on the floor and I would relax myself and think about the first play and what I'm going to do and this and that. So it was something that I was able to carry with me uh, a long time. What does it mean to both of you that Notre Dame is coming to your home area to play a football game? Uh, very exciting. Uh, Notre Dame... Uh, has a long history in, te in Texas, uh, starting with me. Uh, the reason I went to Notre Dame, I had no intention of going to Notre Dame until they came uh, uh, out and started playing Texas in the bowl games when they first started playing in bowl games again. So uh, I, that caught my interest, and I think it catches the interest of a lot of, a lot of folks around here and, and potential players as well, uh, and, student, and students, student athletes, which mm. is what we all love about Notre Dame. Uh, that's why I went there, for sure. Well, folks at Alabama don't hear, want to hear anything about student athletes, but that's a whole other story. Uh, ooh, uh, ooh. 
my, uh, my, my radio show I do, they be giving me all kinds of grief, man, but uh, we, we go right back at them, that's for sure. Uh, you know, for me, it, it's pretty special for Notre Dame to be here. Um, you know, when I left here in, in 84, um, it was a hotbed of college football here. I mean, and there were a lot of bad things going on too, but for, for me to leave at that particular time, people looked at me like I was crazy. I mean, this is Texas football, how are you gonna leave? Uh, but I went to ND for one reason, that was to get a great education. I didn't go there to win a Heisman or, or, or you know, go to the NFL. I went there to get a great education. That place gave me uh, the best opportunity to do that and, and move on with my life. So, uh, but you know, it's funny because people look at you funny. Like, well, you think you're somebody because you left Texas. And, and so I, I need all these people here to, you know, <laughs> to, uh, to help me uh, with this. But uh, you know, this is such a special deal. I really wish my brother could have been here. Uh, because I, he is the reason why I ended up at Notre Dame. And I don't think in a crowd like this, I would have loved to have called him out and, and uh, have him to stand up, because if not for him, he was the one who convinced my parents. He was one of these Subway alumni guys who knew everything about the school, who um, you know, knew about the education and all those kind of great things. So, uh, and it's because of him that, uh, that, uh, that I went to the university. So, uh, but I love, I wish we can come down here every year. I mean, I think it's great. It's great for the area, and I think we, you know, we have one of the best alumni associations around. So uh, it's great for me, that's for sure. As we wrap this up, I just want to get an update on what you're doing now, because people often ask me, why have you been there so long? Well, one reason is they haven't fired me yet, which I'm very thankful for. But the other reason is the guys are all coming back now after three decades, and to a man or a woman, regardless of sport, they are all tremendously successful, and they all give back to their communities. And I'm not sure many other schools can say that about their student athletes. So, uh, Robin, what do you do right now for folks that may not know? I'm a commercial real estate broker. Uh, I, everything I learned started with a basis in the business school at Notre Dame. It taught me uh, uh, discipline and it taught me that, uh, uh, you know, good managerial techniques. I, I, I majored in uh, business management uh, and I was able to carry that on through uh, uh, to my commercial real estate business. Wonderful because I've been able to mentor a lot of young brokers uh, people that had no clue uh, about getting into the real estate business. I said, you ought to get into the real estate business. And uh, I've got uh, quite a few people that I've uh, been able to do that and are uh, uh, very successful at it uh, as a result. So that Notre Dame tradition, that basis, carried on in my life and has carried on in other people's lives as well. In addition to your broadcasting uh, duties, what are you doing? Well, you got to do the broadcasting because, you know, I'm, I'm going to be sitting on my couch talking about the game anyway, so I might as well get paid for it. So, <laughs> But uh, I, I do enjoy doing that. I do a uh, serious radio on Fridays and I'm supposed to be on, at work right now, but I'm here. Uh, and on Sunday night uh, recap show with uh, NFL recap show with Jack Arut. Uh, but I have a company called Smart Giving Cards, and what we do is we help nonprofit organizations fundraise. Uh, we hooked up a deal with MasterCard and Visa, where you can have a reloadable card, and uh, every time you use it, they donate a portion of that transaction back to the nonprofit. So uh, it's something that's going very good for me right now. I also have a company called Smart Living. We've got Smart Giving and Smart Living. Uh, since I retired from the game, I have not taken one Advil, uh, no, not one pain pill, anything. And I've been able to do that because of some all natural products that I take. So, um, so we're trying to, it's a smart living concept, but we're using other products. So we're trying to get people to get away from the Advils and all that kind of stuff and, and use, uh, use uh, these all natural products. And I just finished my book. I just fin <clears throat> finished my book called the, uh, we're calling it The Making of a Man. And uh, so we tell a, a lot of Notre Dame stories. Uh, it's geared for men and boys. Uh, so we're going to release the book uh, right around Father's Day next year. So looking forward to that. It's been going great so far. Got lots of free time, don't you? A lot of free time. <laughs> yes. Ladies and gentlemen, two of your native sons.